we're actually going to study this passage today. We've been teaching the book of, of Philippians, and uh, when we got to the subject of prayer, uh, we studied it positively based on what it says in Philippians, our access to God, the things that we're allowed, to, or not allowed, the things that we're encouraged to pray about and, and not be afraid to go before the Lord. And, but then we also, and there's, there's more back in Philippians when we get back there concerning about, about prayer and how God's working in the age of grace, that it's going to be real important. But we, we started talking about the things that are a hindrance to prayer. And there's a lot of false teaching that actually is a hindrance to your prayer life, getting you to pray about things that you ought not to be praying about, ex having expectations that God never determined that you should have. And, uh, and so we're given some warnings here because those, uh, to, to be taught something false and to have false expectations, even concerning what God is actually doing in your life, in the age of grace in which we're living today and, and be taught those things and not see them as a reality in the world and in your own life is certainly a discouragement to your Christian life. So we're giving you some warnings. Uh, with that, let me read to you Mark chapter 9, verse 14. It says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him, and asked the, the uh, uh, and he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my, my son, which is which hath a dumb spirit. And whither so uh, and and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that uh, that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him and said, O oh, uh, answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long sh uh, shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto uh, brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit teareth him, and he fell on the ground and wailing, foaming. And he asked the father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes he is cast into the fire uh, and into waters and, and to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible unto him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help mine unbelief. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the false spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and, was, uh, and he was as one dead, insomuch as many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, saying, uh, uh, privately, why could not we have cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now let's pray. Father, we dare not come to your scriptures without turning to you first for, for your insight and for your Holy Spirit to guide us into the, the truth of the what's written on this page and the other verses that we'll be looking at today. And we pray as we bring that into the subject of prayer that Father will be edified and built up and, and have a greater knowledge of, of, of things that are true uh, in I, other ages and even also in the age in which we're living in today. So pray for, we pray for understanding and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, before I get back to this, I want you to understand what we're doing. And one of the ways that we've done this is when we study any subject in the Bible, it's important to study the subject dispensationally. That is, to understand what, what age we're living in today, and then when we read a portion of Scripture, what age that, was, that, that is speaking about. And uh, when we talk about dispensational Bible study, uh, when you study the Bible, it, it is like studying a, a, a truth of, the, of, of any investigation of any other type of literature. For instance, to have an honest 
rational, intelligent, analytical approach to reading any piece of literature, there's really five questions that a person asks themselves when they, they read some literature. First of all, you pick up a piece of literature, and the first thing you want to ask is, who, who's writing it? And then, of course, who, who is it written to? And, and, and then, then when you're asking that question, at, at what time, what era of time was it written? Because that makes a difference. Uh, what events and time does it actually cover? And then when you're all done figuring those things out, then you can analyze the piece of literature and say, okay, what do we learn from this? Now let me give you an example of that. If you're digging around in your backyard and you come across a, a piece of paper that was buried in the ground, and so you dig it out, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to scan that, that piece of paper as fast as you can to find out, what did I just find? And, 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 and then you begin to look at it closely and you'll ask yourself naturally those five questions. The first thing you'll do is it will take this piece of literature that you found and, 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 and you start looking at it and the first thing you notice that it's, it's written by a representative of the United States of America. You go, oh, it's an official document. Then you read it to find out what it's about and you realize it's written to the Chippewa Indians who lived in Algonac. Then, then you read a little bit further and you find out that it's about an agreement of sovereign land rights that the United States recognize that the Chippewa Indians of, of, uh, uh, of Algonac have concerning their land. And, and, and then you realize that it outlines the territory that the government of the United States recognizes as theirs. And so what do you learn from the document? Well, you learn that we all own land in Algonac and that the state of Michigan and the, and the United States government can't tell us what to do, we have sovereign right there. That especially if you live in Algonac, you don't have to pay taxes because you don't belong to the United States of America and, uh, and that whatever the United States, whatever the laws are, speed limits and all the rest, you don't have to obey them. Isn't that what you learned? No. <laughs> you learned what was an official document, an agreement, that was made with the Chippewa Indians concerning that territory. So it's those people who lived in that land at that time. Because it wouldn't be true of anybody living in Algonac today. And, 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 and so when you read a piece of literature like that, you, meet it, you don't come to the conclusion that this is written to me. Well, that's true of the Bible. When you go to the Bible, you need to ask yourself when you're reading any of the books of the Bible, who, is it writ who wrote it? Who is it written to? What era of time does it talk about? And, and then, then uh, miss one of those points in there. Uh, what events does it cover? And then you end up learning about those people at that time and that event and so forth. We live in the, what the Bible calls the dispensation of the grace of God. And, and even when you're outside of the dispensation of the grace of God, now let me explain to you, the dispensation of the grace of God is the time in which God interrupted his dealings with Israel raised up the Apostle Paul, turned to us Gentiles, and is offering us his grace because of the cross work of Christ, and a relationship, Jew and Gentile alike, a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, and a promise that after this age is over, we're going to be raptured out, and then you find out that God's going to fulfill his promises to Israel that he already had promised back here. So we live in this interrupted period of time where God interrupted his dealings with Israel, doing something new and different, revealed to the Apostle Paul, written to us concerning our age, our time, our place, but realizing that this time is different than what God was doing and what God is going to do. And when you realize Paul's the Apostle of Gentile, that's what you're doing. That's what dispensational Bible study is about. Now, let's take it outside of Paul's epistles and realize that when you're in the, the Bible that's written to the nation of Israel, that when you're prior to the coming of Jesus Christ and even what we've already studied, the coming of Jesus Christ, God was dealing with the nation of Israel under the law. Now that's been important to the sub subject of prayer in the last couple weeks. We've looked at that. And, and so God was dealing with them under the law. But I want you to understand something else as we're going to progress because we're going to really, well, this is Bible study time. When Jesus Christ came, he came and lived under the law. But think about the things that he said. John the Baptist actually started saying it first. When John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy unlatch, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
So what John is telling Israel, here, I'm coming, calling you to repentance and to baptism and to confession of your sins, and to make Israel back in right relationship with Jesus Christ. But he immediately says Jesus Christ is going to do something else. There's going to be a transition that's going to take place with the coming of Jesus Christ that's going to take the nation of Israel from under the law to ultimately under the new covenant. And in the process of that, Jesus Christ is going to come, and in the process of Jesus Christ coming, he's going to end up baptizing with the Holy Spirit, and then later on, fire, that's being thrown in the lake of fire to those who did not repent and become the believing remnant of Israel. And then ultimately, even after that, he's going to set up his kingdom, and, and that's when the new covenant comes into effect for the nation of Israel. So as we're going to study, it, turning to a place like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, here's the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, He's coming to Israel under the law, but they're going to go through a transition about what's about to come to, their, come to them in the future. None of that has anything to do with the age of grace in which we live in. The time in which we live in is an interruption of that age. Now, and, and so if you're reading their piece of literature, you're, re, you're reading Mark, who's writing concerning the nation of Israel, it's the ministry of Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel, concerning the nation of Israel, in a period of time in which they're transitioning from the old, but they're not into the new covenant yet, and they're going to go through a process in which they're going to transition into that, and, and, and the things that are being taught regard Israel under that transitional time. Now, with that, I want to show you some things. Hold your place in Mark chapter 9. Come over with me to Matthew chapter 21. One of the, what I call the hindrances to prayer because of the false teaching that men, men give and, and teach is the teaching that the, we were basing on the fact that they say that no believer today should be, ever be sick should ever be poor, should ever be in danger or harm's way because that's not God's will for us, that, the, the, that what you should do, that if those things come upon you, you should pray believing, and if you pray believing, then, then you'll be delivered from anything that you experience that way, whether it be deliverance from illness, uh, whether it be deliverance from poverty, whether it be deliverance from danger, all you got to do is pray believing and you'll receive it. Now, one of the, the, the verses, some of the verses they use to say that, you're holding both places, right? Before I read Matthew, look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. Jesus said unto him, can't, uh, uh, if, if, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So, here's a man who wanted some healing for his son, and the Lord said, if you can believe, it's possible, so now it's going to depend on you whether you believe or not. They, another verse that they would take you to, and watch how interesting this is, come to Matthew chapter 21, and look at verse 22. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So that there's the prayer promises that everything, everything that you ask in prayer believing you're going to receive. So if you're sick and you go to God and pray that you get well and you don't get well, you have a problem. You didn't believe. You don't let some preacher like me tell you that promise is not written to you. You just believe it. And, 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 and if, you, if you believe it, it'll happen. In fact, look at verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which was done to the fig tree, but also if ye say unto the, this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. Man, that's powerful, huh? Move a mountain. So all you got to do is just believe, and if, you, and if you don't get what you want, the problem is you didn't believe. Well, now we've got a couple verses to look at here. Now, one of the other, th well, there's just so many things. When you read that, we said you need to know who wrote it. Well, Mark's writing it. Who is it written to? Well, it's Jesus Christ's ministry to the nation of Israel, but his public ministry is already over. The people that he's addressing here are his apostles. 
And, and that becomes more and more important. We'll look at that in some other places. Even in verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have, have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done. Well, what was just done? Well, now remember when we started talking about prayer, one of the things we said, you'll be misled if you just let someone grab a verse and give it to you and say you ought to do it and here's what it means. That you need to have understanding when you read the scriptures. You need to read, and not just read a verse, but understand the verse. There's something that was just done there. A fig tree was cursed. Now we're not going to get into that. I just want, to, I just want you to start thinking. And so I know how to get you to start thinking. It's get to get you kind of confused. See, in the verses before that, Jesus Christ is coming back. Look at verse 18. Now in the morning as he returned unto the city, he hungered. And so as Jesus Christ is coming back into the city of Jerusalem, he's hungry, there's a fig tree. Interestingly, you read it in the other gospel accounts, it's not even the time for ripe figs to be there. But he goes to a fig tree, and he finds only leaves on the tree, no figs, and he curses the fig tree. Now what I love to do is ask someone when they read that passage, did Jesus Christ just wake up grumpy that day? I mean, I mean... If it's not even a time for figs to be ripe, and he sees a fig tree, and there's nothing but figs, and he curses the tree, and it just withers right like that. The disciples are amazed. Whoa. And he says, hey, you think that's something? You'll not only be able to do that, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move, and it'll be gone. Whatsoever you ask in my name, believing, it'll be done. Well, there's something to do with that fig tree in there. So that must represent something. Now, if you're a Bible student, fig tree and leaves of a fig tree will come to your mind real fast. You'll think back in Genesis, Adam and Eve, when they sinned and tried to deal with their own sin, they tried to cover it up with fig leaves, right? The, the figs have nothing to do with the parable. It's, it's the, if, there, if there is the way a fig tree grows, when it grows the, the leaf, the fig grows under the leaf. Even if it's not time for the figs to be ripe, there's no fig there, according to the passage, which tells you this tree is never going to bear fruit. Those who don't have fruit are going to be burned in the fire. Jesus Christ is coming back to the city of Jerusalem. Where are the people waiting for him? He's calling out the believing remnant of Israel. Now, I'll just stop there because I said I was going to let you think about that one. Why we're in Matthew, flip back to chapter 17. Because this is interesting, You'll have, you can do this fast. Look at verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming... There's a multitude gathered. There's a certain man who deals, kneels down. Verse 15, his son is a lunatic. And, he's, uh, and it describes how the devil's in him and all the things that take place. This is the same passage we read just in Mark chapter 9. And, uh, and, and in verse 19 it says, then, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence, hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So Matthew adds a little more detail that what he said to the disciples. He not only said this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting, he reminded the apostles, well actually he spoke it for the first time, about being able to say to a mountain, Move. Well, what does saying to a mountain move mean? Well, that's not going to be the me my message is about. But you watch what I teach and see if you can't figure that out. Let's go back to Mark chapter 9. Now, if you don't get anything out about what, what I'm going to teach, you get, at least get this part. In the context of Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, about this man, and whether you take it in Matthew 21, verse 22, whatsoever you ask in faith believing, or you take it in this Mark passage, look at verse 18. It says, And wherever he ta uh, taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake unto thy disciples, and they could not cast him out. Uh, uh, that they would cast him out, and they could not. So, and, and then look uh, as well to verse 28. And when he was come unto the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? 
Now, if you think about the passage, who lacks the faith? Who couldn't cast out the devil? The apostles couldn't cast out the devil. If you go to a faith healer, and the faith healer lays his hands, and you don't get healed, the problem isn't you didn't have the faith to believe. The problem is the faith healer's got a problem. Everyone wants to blame the person who's sick, but when you look at the passage, the problem is the people that, that was there, they didn't have the power to do it. And, and the faith healer, he always blames the person, oh, you didn't get healed because of you. No one ever blames the faith healer as he goes to the next town and leaves a bunch of sick people behind who never got their healing, and he goes to the next town, has another faith healing meeting. When you look at the passage, when it said that Matthew 21, verse 22, whatsoever ye ask believing, isn't the faith healer the guy praying and saying, Father, heal him? And it doesn't happen? The problem isn't with the person, the problem is the healer himself. He doesn't have the power. So, <laughs> if you don't get anything, understand this, that it's not you believing, it's the person doing the healing. He doesn't have the faith. But he don't have the power because God never gave it to him. When I said that you, you need to read a passage and have some understanding, it, now it's time to grow up. Here we are reading a passage like this, and it brings a lot of confusion to our minds. And What is this really all about? Well, let me try to simplify it for you. Let me ask you a question. Who is the God of Israel? God, the true and living God, Jehovah God, the Lord Jesus Christ in person. The, the point is, is when you read the Old Testament scripture, the Old Testament always says that God says, I will be your God and ye shall be my people, saith the Lord. The true and living God is the God of the nation of Israel. Who's the God of the nations? <laughs> That's the whole point. That if, if God is the God of Israel, that's because Satan is the God of all the other nations. Other than the nation of Israel, the Gentiles are worshiping idols, and those idols are actually just a worship of Satan himself, the God of this world. So that only Israel has God as their God. The nations, they're, they're all already possessed by Satan. They already, that Satan already has them under his control. When Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel, Rome is dominant over the nation of Israel. Israel hadn't been a power since the time of the king, end of Kings and Chronicles when they were given over to the Gentiles. They might be back in the land, but they're still ruled by the Gentiles. Rome rules over Israel. Who rules over Rome? Satan does. The reason I'm saying that to you is why is there so much satanic activity in Jerusalem? Because Satan has taken his forces and filled the land of Israel with his forces because he already owned the rest of the world. Didn't he tell Jesus Christ when he tried to tempt him that if you'll bow down and worship me, see the kingdoms of the world, I'll give them to you. Because they were his. The only one that belonged to God was Israel, but they're under the power of the Roman government. The influence of Satan is filled the land. That's, that's, that's the time in which Jesus Christ comes to the nation of Israel, and they're, they're like that because they've broken the law, God's laws, and God had turned them over to the Gentiles. So with that, Jesus Christ has come. Now, come back to Matthew chapter 4. Got to kind of do this fast so that you can put this together. You know, people like to study demon possession, but they don't understand what it's all about. There's really a battle between God and Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ shows up, John the Baptist prior to him, but Jesus Christ shows up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The God of heaven has come down to earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, to sit on the throne of David. The gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus Christ is going to establish his reign on this earth through the nation of Israel. Now keep in mind, there's a battle between God and Satan over this. Verse 24, And his fame went through, well, verse 23 says, Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, with his message about his kingdom coming is going to be the end of diseases and sickness. 
Verse 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and tormented, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic. Well, that's, the kind, that's what we're studying, isn't it? And those that had palsy, and he healed them. And there followed a great multitude of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Jude, Judea, and beyond Jordan. What? You know what he's demonstrating? He's preaching the kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's not here yet, is it? They're going through that transition. The kingdom is coming. The king is here. And he's demonstrating what life in his kingdom will ultimately be like. There's no demons in his kingdom. He's going to come in. Not only is he going to get rid of the sickness and the sufferings, he's going to get rid of the demons. But there is sickness and suffering already there because Israel's under the curse. And Satan has filled the land. The last thing he wants to do is give up that territory to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ comes and he's now casting out devils. Look at Matthew chapter 10. It says in verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans, Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopard, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you receive, freely give. Now the twelve are going to go out and preach and have the same power that Jesus Christ had. Now, we, there's just so many things to teach. But you know, when you read that passage, the reason I stopped here, I had a, a man push my buttons this week on the phone. <laughs> he got on the phone, I was real nice to him, we had a lot of talk, we disagreed about everything we talked about. He was very versed, and, and I tried to explain some things to him, and we finally, I just told him, okay, he said, one more time, okay, let me say one more thing, okay. Finally, the one more, no, no, no. He said, well, I want to order something. I said, I'll give you my wife. Gave my wife. Next thing I heard her say, no, we don't speak in tongues. And <laughs> so I had to pick up the phone. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and so he wanted to get in a couple more talk about, about some things. And so he gets into this thing about his pastor gave him a handkerchief to give to a guy in a nut house. And he put the handkerchief on, on the guy. And two weeks later, the guy was released from the nut house. So, so I, I began to talk to him about the reality of his doctrine and how nonsense that what he believes in the reality of life that he lives in, that none of that is true. And uh, anyhow, one of, one of the things that I asked him, I says, who's your pastor to get a handkerchief from him? You realize what that's about. I don't know if you know that. But in, in, the, in the book of Acts, the shadow of Peter passing over some people healed, healed them. When God turned to us Gentiles through the Apostle Paul, it says handkerchiefs were taken from Paul to people and they were healed. Well, when Paul had to deal with some demons, some other men started trying to deal with some demons and those demons looked at those men and they said, you know, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? Well, that's why I was asking this guy, who's your pastor? Why, why, did, why did Peter's shadow do this? Why did Paul's handkerchief do that? When, Paul, when the Lord sent these twelve Jesus sent out, he told them to cast out the devils. Not everybody in Israel is casting out devils. These twelve were given authority by Jesus Christ to do it. That's not for you to read and say, oh, he gave it to them, then I can do it too. What kind of reasoning is that? That the twelve were a special group of people. When Paul went out, he said, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. And the lesson you learn in the book of Acts is that he that wrought in Peter, effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in Paul to the Gentiles. That's what you learn. You learn that God sent Paul to us Gentiles with our message, so when we read Paul's writings, we'll know God's word to us. You don't read the book of Acts and say, well, Paul did it, I can do it. That's what, he just, uh, Hank, just because, why didn't he, why did he take his own handkerchief? Why did he have to take the pastor's handkerchief? See, he just, mimicking things that are in the Bible without any understanding of why it happened. But now here are the apostles. Why is all this happening? Go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Oh, Zechariah 13. You should remember that one. <laughs> Especially because of the number 13.
Zechariah 13, look at verse 1. It says, in that day, and by the way, if you read chapter 12, and you'll find out it's after Jesus Christ has come back and set up his kingdom. So that's the future day. In that day there shall be a fountain opened unto the house of David and unto the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. No more idolatry in Israel. And they, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. When Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, you think there's going to be any demon possession in his land, in his kingdom? He just told you it's going to be cast out. So here he comes, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, casting out devils. When he ultimately sets up his kingdom, there'll be no devils. But there's still some devils, isn't there? He casts some out, he sends the twelve out, they cast some out. There's even after they go out, there's still some more to cast out later. They're not all cast out yet. But he's going to cast them out of their land, out of the land, because they're going to be gone. You know what's also interesting in there? He's going to cause, he's going to cast out the prophets, as if someone's going to prophesy when Bible says God says the Bible's complete. You can't prophesy. You read the next verse. The parents have to stone their kid for trying to prophesy because God didn't send the prophets. He already has sent the prophets. Then he sent apostles. Now the word of God is complete. So there's a warning there about the unclean spirit as well as those who are still continuing to prophesy. We re realize who's part of all that. Now, with all that, with that, that understanding, uh, come back to Mark chapter 9. Now that's, there's really some more understanding I want you to have. I don't know how to divide this message into two, but almost need to. Now I have, uh, there's two more things I have to show you before we get to Mark 9. Come to Revelation 12. Now this is the time in which God is going to be purifying the nation of Israel. Part of the process of purifying is that Satan is going to be cast out of heaven. Look at Revelation 12 and verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Satan and his angels, in the tribulation, in the future time, when God continu continues to deal with Israel, he first cleanses the heavens, and then he's going to cleanse the earth. So before the earth is cleansed, they're cast out of heaven, they're cast down onto the earth. It says in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. Heaven's purified, isn't it? Great rejoicing in heaven. Therefore rejoice, ye, uh, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. By the way, we're raptured into the heavens before any of this takes place. It says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. And the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. He's got three and a half years left. So, they're casting out devils now. There's yet a future time when Satan's going to be cast out of heaven and his demons with him down to the earth, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth during that time. When it's all done, Satan and the beast and the false prophet are cast in a lake of fire. The demons are rid out of the land and Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom come back to Matthew chapter 12 now this is an interesting thing that takes place during the time they're casting out the demons Matthew chapter 12 verse 43 it says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. 
that is the spirit. He's cast out of the man, he's walking around trying to find a dry place, can't find one. Then he saith, I will return to the house from whence I came out. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits, notice this, more wicked than himself. And they entered in and dwelt there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Now, let's put together what we just learned. Jesus Christ is preaching about the kingdom, demonstrating how the spirits won't be there, that he has power over them to cast them out. Even his apostles that, that go out and preach the same thing in his name go out and cast out devils, preaching about that kingdom that's coming. But there's a warning that even Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of heaven down into the earth. This parable tells you that Jesus Christ is casting out some de demons, right? John said, I baptize you with water, but Jesus Christ is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In the transition of the nation of Israel, that Jesus Christ might cast out some devils, but ultimately a person has to be a believer in Jesus Christ, a repentant believer of the nation of Israel in Jesus Christ, and they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. What if they don't? What if they just had the demon cast out of them and never do believe who Jesus Christ is and the promises God has made to them. Well, ultimately, they're going to be baptized with fire. But before they're baptized with fire, in this transition time, demons are going to come back. And even worse demons than before are going to come back and enter in, and the Lord says, the last estate of that man is worse than the first. We thought it was bad before. This is even worse. So there's a time that Israel's going to be cleansed, but they better be careful what they do once they're cleansed because if they don't receive Jesus Christ, they don't trust who Jesus Christ is and the promises of God and receive the Holy Ghost, then the demons are going to be cast back into the land or coming back into the land and it's going to be worse before it gets better when Jesus Christ returns. That brings us to Mark chapter 9. <laughs> My goal was to show you the broad context and then bring it down to, the, to a more defined context. In the broad context, I, I got to do it this way. If you happen to just let your eyes glance up to Mark chapter 8 and like verse 34, it says, And when he called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, and the gospel's sake, uh, the same shall save it. Now, he's talking to them about taking up their cross. He hadn't taken up his cross yet, has he? He hasn't died yet. But he's teaching them some things that not only is he going to die on the cross, he's going to eventually teach them that, but there's going to come a time that they're going to have to take up their cross as well. And if they try to save their life, they're going to lose it. But if they lose their life, they're going to save it. Now, if you know that time in the book of Revelation, what we're talking about when Satan is cast out of heaven, the next chapter is that he enters into the Antichrist, and there's a mark of the beast set up. And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're going to have your head cut off. But if you will deny that and believe that the Antichrist is the Christ, receive his mark on your right hand or on your forehead, you'll save your life. If you save your life, what happens to you? You lose it. Because if you receive that mark of the beast, you're damned. You're not going into that kingdom. The people who are going to go through that time of tribulation, they're going to need to be able to save their life by saying, no, don't give me the mark, cut my head off, and the Lord will raise them up again. Now, I can't finish everything now because we'll hopefully can put all this back together next week and continue. But think about that kid that had the demon cast out of him. Everyone said what? 
They said he's dead. They said Jesus took him by the hand and he arose. As if this person died and rose again. There's a picture in what's going on here. But, but so you, you see them taking up that cross. What's interesting in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And he answered them, Verily I say unto you, There shall be, there shall be some of, you, of them that stand here, which shall not taste death, till they see the kingdom of God come with power. And six days Jesus take with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment did shine exceedingly white as snow, so that no fuller on earth can white. And there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, and they were talking with Jesus. We learned in Sunday school what they talked about, his decease. But he just made a statement there that's real intriguing. He told them, he said, there's some of you standing here that shall not see death till you see the kingdom of God come. Well, the kingdom of God hadn't even come yet, has it? But he didn't say till the kingdom comes. He says you shall see the kingdom of God come. And what he did, he went up into a mountain. He took Peter, James, and John. And right before their eyes, he was transfigured into his kingdom glory. And lo, Moses and Elijah show up right there. Elijah and Moses, I think how the order was. Stand there with him. They're seeing, Peter tells you in 1 Peter, we did not deliver to you cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and majesty of his coming, for we were witnesses. And he's referring to this time here. That the Lord Jesus is showing them what it's going to be like in the kingdom. And he's there in glory. He radiates out through his skin his true glory, the glory of God. And they see it, and they want to build a tabernacle. And all. But Moses and Elijah are there. Now, all that is transpiring. Jesus Christ, i, I got to end with this. I don't even know how to end with this. Anyhow, Jesus Christ is up in the mount. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when he was come to his disciples... He saw a great multitude about them and the disciple and the, and the scribes questioning with him. You know, when you read verse, Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 29, you're reading about a time in which Jesus Christ came back because he was away. He was up in a mountain as if he was up back into heaven. And then he comes back. And when he comes back, this incident took place while he was away. Now that matches exactly what we're talking about, the, deal, the dealings with the nation of Israel, that God is going to deal with them. In, he was dealing with time past. He gives them a picture of the kingdom that's to come. But in between the first coming and the second coming is going to be a time in which Jesus Christ is away and there's going to be such demonic activity on this earth. When he says, this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting, even the apostles couldn't cast them out during this time. Now, if you, just get, if you get that, there's a time they're casting out demons. There's a time even when the apostles can't cast out this kind. The Lord tells them you couldn't do it. But who does finally show up and can cast them out? The Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, they're going to have to pray and fast and wait for Christ to come back. That's the kingdom program. Can you imagine the lunacy of someone telling you that in the age of grace you can do it today? When even when you're reading here, there's a time in which the apostles can, and there's a time when the apostles won't be able to, and, and especially because of the kind that he is until Jesus Christ comes back. What's amazing, back in verse 1, when he says, there's some of you here that won't see death till you see the kingdom come, do you realize between the first coming of Christ and that second coming of Christ is not only the seven years of tribulation, there is 2,000 years of missing time in that verse. The time in which we live in today. And you know, the time today is not a message that you've got to take up your cross and follow him by losing your life, you'll gain it. Because there's no mark of the beast on earth today where you can be damned for taking his mark. The gospel message today centers on the cross of Christ. 
what he did, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and God's free gift, freely given to you by God's grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation today is you trusting what Jesus Christ did, not you denying anything, not you giving up anything, not you give, taking up any kind of cross yourself. It's you trusting in what Jesus Christ did. There's a big difference. I, I need to say more about this next week, and hopefully we can. <laughs> Let's pray for now. Our God and our Father, I, I, I realize that what we've done is teach some things that probably many have never heard before, and yet a reality of what was taking place in the world was evident by the things that were happening and even things that were not happening. And Father, I pray that we might understand when we study the Bible why the things were taking place when they did, why they're not going to take place when they don't, and how they'll ultimately come out because everything is beautiful in your time, not ours. And Father, I pray that people won't take prayer requests and powers that were given to the apostles and try to tell us that we have it, and when we practice it, it's not there, when you never spoke those things to us. Father, help us to understand what it means to read Paul's epistles and believe your message to us today, especially the message of the cross. In Christ's name we pray, amen.